welcome to the REI Mastermind Network, where host Jack Haas gathers amazing stories from leaders in real estate investing. In each episode, our guests will tell you what they're doing that works, what they've tried that failed, and best of all, you'll learn actionable steps to take your real estate investing to the next level. Now, here's Jack with another value-packed episode. We have Andy McMullen on. Andy, I really appreciate your time. And just so that everybody can follow along, I'm going to send them to your website, legacyacquisitions.com. I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes. And uh, Andy is working on uh, redoing the website. So by the time you hear this, it should all be done. And I'm putting them on the spot right now. <laughs> yeah, it's good enough, but it's not good enough for your audience, right? We got, we got about 30... 30 days to really clean our act up. Jack, we'll do it for you. Well, I, I think what's what's great is that uh, even even in its current state, it looks good and it, there's a lot of content here for people. Yeah. yeah so we we're try, gonna, we try to have some resources for them, get some resources for hopefully future partners, people that are curious about uh, passive investing, people that are curious about active investing. So hopefully that they'll get some value out of it. So we're going to be talking about something that you, a project that you're working on right now, actually, that uh, is really interesting. And you're calling it the built, built to rent project. Um, yeah. But before we do, uh, let's kind of unravel, like, how did you land into this niche? I mean, this, this, is, this is going to be an interesting conversation, but it's always interesting to hear people's backstory and how they came to this type of project. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I, I I started in real estate probably about 20 years ago, Jack. I mean, I basically started as an office and broker, right? Just kind of uh, doing some investment sales and, you know, really a lot of transaction-based work and uh, finally kind of figured out that I wanted to be, I was working at a boutique firm. So I had a lot of exposure to investors and fund managers, even property managers. It was all kind of an integrated boutique firm. And uh, so I started to kind of get into that vesting world pretty early on. Uh, and then uh, some de development in maybe the 2000, mid 2000s. And, uh, you know, probably after eight crash, after things started to come back, started buying stuff again, maybe tw 11, 12, in that range, more in the kind of multifamily arena. Uh, a lot of stuff in California, a lot of stuff in, you know, Central California, a lot of stuff in Southern California. I'm mean, here in San Diego. And then when rent control was re was enacted, it became a little bit less predictable for our investor to get them their returns consistently because we had so much for cash for keys and all the rest of it. So we started to pivot our business a little bit and partner up with other people across the country. You guys talk a lot about the smile states. You know, um, we did some stuff in North Carolina and Texas and Florida. And so, you know, it just kind of as we were doing some of these multifamily projects, and we're st we still really like multifamily, we still like makes a lot of sense. We started to hear a lot more with some of our partners and talking about this built to rent trend. And uh, so that's just a little bit of how we got there. And then I'll, you know, let you let it breathe, and we'll, you can ask whatever you want about the actual trend itself. Yeah, well, let's let's just jump right in there. You know, when you say built to rent, what what do you mean exactly by that? Yeah, so you know, built to rent has obviously been going on for a long time. We've had you know, you develop a apartment building and you build it and you get renters, right? Um, we also kind of had these scattered after two thousand eight. We kind of had these scattered rental houses that were being managed by these big funds very inefficiently, right? You'd have you know a portfolio across many counties of all of these these homes, and then you know, geniuses started to figure out why don't we just have a horizontal multifamily projects, what we call it, just kind of thinking of a multifamily pulled apart and we'll build all these smaller, you know, a single family homes there. We'll manage them exactly like a rental community with the, you know, dog parks and playgrounds and pools and clubhouses, but it will all be new, it'll all be enclosed. And where rents are going now, we can actually get a return. So that's why you're seeing so much of Wall Street money coming in because for the longest time they've been trying to, you know, bond returns are so low, you know, stock market's so risky and, and unpredictable. But if they can invest in these larger projects, watch the growth of the rents, manage the efficiencies of 
pulled apart multifamily, then they can get their pension funds, et cetera, investors, their, their returns every year. So that's kind of why it became such this tsunami over the last maybe, it's been going on for a while, but maybe over the last 12 to 24 months, we started to see more and more money pour in. Sure. So is this the first time you're tackling a project of this nature? Yeah. So, I mean, I, we've had some, some single family projects in the past, but uh, I don't consider this single family. I consider this multifamily, horizontal multifamily. Um, now, our partner, obviously, in uh, Lafayette, this particular product that we're doing is in Lafayette. We do them in the southeast. I'll get into some criteria of what, where we choose, why we choose. But uh, he, our partner's been doing this for you know the last five, ten years, and he's developed you know probably fifty projects. So um, the first time, kind of, I'm I'm uh, asset managing this specific type of project, except. I don't really think of it that much different from my perspective, asset managing, you know, 100 to 200 unit apartment buildings, which we do have experience. I think the difference typically is the multifamily guys that are coming into the space. And there's a lot because of all of those things that I mentioned. I think the difference is that the multifamily guys have to build differently, right? The density is different. The construction costs are different. So you, if you're going to do it, there's definitely a builder kind of you know relationship that you're going to need to create because it's a different kind of construction process sure so let's talk about this project in particular it sounds yeah. like you got a lot going on i mean how many units will this be when it's all said and done yeah so this will be 98 units um, we built out about uh, six uh, units so far um, and so we built them really kind of 1200 square foot cottages really they're they're really tanks because they they're really strong build but they've got you know 20 foot yard backyard you know dog park playground community barbecue area things like that and it's gated and it's closed and so we get a lot of millennials a lot of younger families they're all three two bedrooms um, and we even get a lot of um you know, empty nesters, you know, that's basically new stuff. I mean, we, we kind of say, hey, look, uh, you won't have to do a single thing except change your light bulb, right? We cut the grass, we do all of that for you like we would, except you don't have somebody below you or above you. You've got your own house, your own space, with your own backyard, and all the amenities that you would have had if you were in an apartment complex. So are they pretty much the same floor plan from one house, one to the next, or can people make it a little bit more individual or customized? Yeah. So, so it, for efficiencies, we build them all the same layout. They're all three, two layout, high clearance, a lot of shiplap and stuff you see on HGTV, but then we change the elevation. So the exteriors are a little bit different. They can kind of pick finishes here and there. That would be a little bit different. The porches might be a little bit different. But the reason that we can build so many a month is because of these kind of efficiencies that we've got subcontractors that we had for the, you know, many years that are doing this exact same kind of, uh, and it's obviously evolved, right? Finishes, you kind of find out what people like, what people don't like. Um, but yeah, the, the, all the interiors are exactly the same. Well, what's kind of neat or interesting about this is that unlike a multifamily traditional vertical building, you know, you have to, you'd have to wait for that entire building to be constructed before you could start renting, let's say a hundred units. But in this situation, you can put up one at a time, get a renter in and, and actually get, get cash flowing fairly quickly. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So we started, when we started doing our underwriting, the first unit that we filled was about 1500 in rent. Um, now we're on the sixth, so we were on the sixth unit and now we're already at, I think at 1650. Now some areas like we've got land tied up in other markets in the Southeast, they'll be more expensive. Some areas are a little less expensive. It just kind of depends. And some areas will build, you know, 150 on a larger 18 acre site. But I just think it's interesting that we were able to lease them so quickly, collect the rent so quickly and now as we build with each one it's got its own separate CO, co certificate of occupancy as soon as that's stamped we can get them in there and rent so we don't have to wait like a multifamily developer would 
you know, for the entire project to be built. The other thing that I think is is interesting is that the tenants tend to stay a little bit longer, right? They, right? They've got new stuff. They've got their new backyard. The turnover, you know, on a multifamily might be 50%, right? You know, in a built to rent community, it's probably in the, the 30s. So there's a, there's, there's quite a few differences that I think you know again we still we still love the idea of multifamily part the reason that everybody's doing so great is because of rents but um we just feel like this is kind of the next next wave and we want to balance out our portfolio with these kinds of projects so you take care of all of the lawn care and everything the 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 resident doesn't have to do that yeah so just think of it as a a multifamily project we would do the lawn we do you know all of the exterior lighting you know, anytime that there's, uh, you know, the plumbing stuck, all that stuff, we come and fix it. We have a management company that would be there. We have day porters just like you would at a, at a multifamily project. Um, you know, you know, there'll, there'll be a couple things here and there, but mostly, yeah, just to turn on your, you change your light bulb. That's it. Okay. So and that's just part of the reason I think this, go ahead. Sorry, Jack. No, yeah. I was just going to remind everybody to head over to your site again, that legacy acquisitions.com. So you can follow along and, and uh, I'm guessing that uh, you'll probably have some photos of some of this up on there. But uh, what I was going to go to is that, so you got the living living space. It's like 1,200 square feet. Do you give them like a garage, that type of thing as well? It's, uh, it depends on, the, and this particular one, it's more of a carport. Um, they have driveways, but but no, in this particular one, we don't have a garage. And that's part of the reason we have that, the speed with which we can build. Um, but on a project like we're working on something in, in Foley, Alabama, where it would be an 18 acre site and we, you know, have maybe 150 units, we're going to have to build a clubhouse, a pool, you know, um, and a garage, right? Because it's a different kind of area. Um, and we try, I, I would say like our criteria of people that are curious is really finding kind of the areas where the land is still relatively inexpensive and in Southeast for the most part, you can still find some pretty decent land. Um, it's gotta, ha- it's gotta be next to some good elementary schools. Cause a lot of them are young families that we're renting to. And then mm-hmm. you gotta have some amenities close by close to a major thoroughfare. That's, that's kind of the, the area we like to be in. And, you know, many of these projects that are in major markets, some of them are in the suburbs and some of them are in the, excerpts you know it just kind of depends but um that's kind of that's kind of what we're going for at this point sure by the way did i answer your question yeah <laughs> no I, I was kind of curious i mean this this sounds you know I've, I've tried to run the numbers myself to to do a build to rent situation and it, the numbers have never worked at least not in my area but i guess i've never considered you're buying like a chunk of land and putting in a hundred units I mean the yeah. the chance for scaling and keeping construction people busy like just go from one to the next I mean there's there's probably some savings there just with with that scaling in a localized yeah. area. Yeah, there's some there's there are definitely some economies of scale. I mean we've got you know so we're building about 8 per acre, right? So you know you can you can have some efficiencies there. Um, I would say that, you know, in, in Lafayette, for instance, you know, we can get in our vertical cost, meaning the, the amount it would cost for us to build the project, the actual home, et cetera, you know, less the infrastructure, all of that is probably about 90,000 a door. Um, we're probably all in honestly, Jack at like a hundred and thirty, and we've, and we've got a pretty big contingency in there. So. We can still, when you're collecting rents that are in that sixteen fifty, you know, we can we can make it work. Mm-hmm. No, and then so what? What else have you found then regarding this? Like you've already talked about, like a dog park and a and a few other things to attract people to that. You're you're essentially creating a little community. Like what other things yeah. have you have you added to this this community to attract people? Yeah, you know, one thing that we're really big on, so, you know, in our fund, we we uh, partner up sometimes with other operators. And the big thing for us is that we want, you know, partners that are, you know, obviously good at what they do experience, but they're they're doing something good in the community. And so while one project we did in, in uh, North Carolina, we brought in a group called uh, Apartment Life. Um, and again, we were a partner. The, 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 the team that did this deal was, was fantastic, the asset management, et cetera. We were really just you know the fund but but that we wanted to make sure so they had apartment life which would be kind of like an ra for the community they would throw 
pool parties and barbecues and Bible study and, you know, things that kind of bring a community together. And so that was a 300 unit project. And now you see kids, you know, outside on the playground. So it does give us a lot of kind of, you know, as some investors will push back, well, why are you doing that with our money? Right. Like you go ahead and you, you invest whatever you want, but let my money decide which charities I'm giving it to. And our response is always, well, look, this is makes for stickier communities, better reviews, better return for our investors. So we really try to have that element. So for this one, you know, we've already scheduled, we'll have, you know, our ice cream days for the kids and we'll have the barbecues set up and we're partnering up with an organization that's going to be, you know, figuring out how we can help, you know, bless these communities, educational tools, things like that. We did a, uh, we did a Dave Ramsey kind of app for every one in our project that wanted it for, you know, just budgeting, general self, you know, mm -hmm. just general personal yeah. planning, that kind of thing. So um, we, we try to have some kind of element that that's kind of where we feel like we can really make a, a difference with our investors. So let's, let's talk about the, the buildings themselves. Then are you, I'm guessing that you're using or leveraging as low maintenance materials as possible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's stick build, but you know, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send over the, the videos and I will we'll maybe put them in the show notes or some pictures, but um, you'll look at these things and you'll be like, whoa, that, th I mean, 1200 square feet might sound small to some people, but the way that it's laid out and you got, you know, nine foot clear, you know, walls and accent walls and, and that open backyard of 20 feet, it's quite a bit of space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is kind of also interesting is that unlike a, a traditional multifamily, if you choose to exit down the road, I mean, you could probably still sell them off as individual single family homes. Yeah. So our plan A would be to sell them to one single buyer. So we would stabilize the asset, um, you know, and sell to an institution. And, and there's a ton of institutions in this game now, right? So you've got BlackRock has been in, Blackstone. Now you've got Lennar that's just, they're actually, instead of building everything for sale, they've got a group of, of homes that they're building just for this rent in the same way that they're trying to, to achieve these returns. I think that, you know, really where, where, this, where this is going is that we could do plan A would be that, plan B would be maybe to just cluster them in groups of 10, sell them to a smaller investor, Mm -hmm. um, and I think before we would even consider a selling these units one by one, because I do think that's a different business. We've done that before, but I think it's a different business. You got the brokers and you, you're paying the commissions and you got a lot of marketing to do. Um, and you got to have a lot of staff to do it. I think before we do that, we would probably refinance and hold them long term. Sure. So there is multiple exit strategies, which I like about this type of asset as well. Yeah. So, you know, during with everything going on right now, lumber prices and everything, has that changed any of your numbers or strategies? Yeah, you know, gosh, we, when we started underwriting this project, uh, lumber had skyrocketed up to, it was like 1500 per 1000 foot floor, which is, you know, I, that's an insane number, right? Um, and so we had, you know, 15% contingency. Uh, we thought it would come down a little bit, um, but we knew that we wanted to have a lot of contingency. So we've kept that contingency in place. Uh, the prices have come down to you know five and six hundred per thousand foot board, but it's possible that there's supply chain issues that could come up. Um, you know, lumber. You know, it's a small part of the build, but it, it prices could go up. So we wanted to make sure that we had some some risk mitigants in place if if things like that do do happen. I think the other thing that, that a lot of these guys can do and we would do certainly if costs got out of control is again the lender, you know, we're only paying on that money, the draws that we get, right? That we receive. So since we've got, let's say we get to 20 units and prices go crazy, we can always just stop there, sit tight, collect the the rent, and then wait to build until it's it's time to do that. Mm -hmm. No, so like you you're obviously then, you know, funding this, whether it is through a banking relationship, but you probably are already bringing other people on board to 
to help you with this project, how do people, if they were interested, how do they get involved and, and what would be their participation? Um, yeah, well, certainly. I, yeah, I would love to get, you know, we're going to be doing multiple projects, right? So I would love to, to talk to anybody who's curious about this trend. I mean, I think this one, particularly in Lafayette, because we, you know, it's probably not going to be available um, by the time this comes out. Um, certainly reach out to me if it is, but I, we're, we're moving pretty, pretty quickly on our um, raise. We, we're currently raising and it's only a two and a half million dollar raise. So I think we'll, we'll probably be fine. But we've got, again, the project in Foley where we're going to do the exact same thing. And we're doing one in, um, in Houston and we're doing one in, um, in northern Louisiana called an area called Gonzales, which would be kind of a nicer, larger project. Mm-hmm. So depending on the areas of the country that you're building it, are you planning different activities or draws for to to make a community i'm it's it'd yeah. be interesting to know if you found that there's a difference from texas to louisiana like yeah. what, what are the expectations there yeah it, it is interesting you know so some some communities you might have so some lafayette you know this area we kind of figured out is probably going to be a lot of uh younger families right so you know we can do we can build r- relatively nice things relatively inexpensively Rent's kind of in that 1500, 16 rate. If we're going, you know, we got to pay, you know, for if we're doing 18 acres and we're building 140 units, but it's in a different market where rents are a little bit higher, we're going to have to deliver a much nicer, I mean, nicer, I should say, more luxurious product, right? And that we would have to have the clubhouse and the pool and all these communities we might not need to. In a community like we're doing now, you know, just a, a playground and dog park and doggy doors in the back and the backyard. Some of those are renting faster because they're bigger on the backyards than even some of those other places that might have some of those amenities. So mm-hmm. we're constantly, constantly, you know, um, tweaking, tweaking it. It's got to be the acquisition process. You should see our acquisition guy, Chris Vaughn, is, is incredible with the amount of uh, data that he's collecting for each market. And then, you know, there's been thousands of owners that we've had to talk to in order to kind of get, get it down to an area and a site that makes sense. And we're also competing, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not large. We're kind of still at that area where we, you know, a smaller guy, we could build it and then sell it to somebody else. So we're not competing with the Lenars and the institutional guys of the world, but we are competing with other multifamily operators maybe that are, that that you know are they still like our multifamily, but they kind of see this as the new trend. It, they see this as a scaling opportunity. So in that one to two hundred range, it you know we're starting to see a little bit of competition. Mm-hmm. No, this is a really interesting pro- project, and and how you got this pulled off. I mean, like I said, you know, you run the numbers, and sometimes it doesn't it doesn't seem to make sense, you know, to, to build one unit just as a rental property. But when you clump them together like this, it, it, it sounds like uh, you've really f- found that formula. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's our, our partner, right? We can certainly, you know, take credit for, for asset managing and running back office and having, you know, 20 years of bruises on my arms that I kind of can identify a good deal, but I, but I can't, I can't take credit for what our acquisition guys and, 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 you know, construction and, you know, builders are doing. I mean, that's just, he's been, my Derek, my partner, Derek, Alex and Dranko, who, you know, I hope to, you have him on the show at some point. Um, he, you know, what he's been doing for five, 10 years, you know, he had figured out before a lot of these guys made sense. And he was doing it on a smaller scale, but, um, you know, he was just thinking like, Hey, look, I can build these, rent them collect cash flow for my family. And then he, then, then, then he meets me and I said, well, wait, let's go, let's go a little bit bigger here. And so finally we convinced him to, to scale this thing a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's really kind of neat to see what's happening. You know, I think too, Jack, the, the, the idea of the American dream as we kind of understood it when we were growing up, certainly when my parents were growing up has changed some, right? So the idea of just kind of owning your home, maybe and people were around 2008 to see what that was like right you know if we're being honest we've seen rent growth year over year since the 40s right and even during inflationary times usually it moderates very slightly people still expect rents to increase 
But I think those people that own the homes, they saw what happened to their, in many cases, their life savings, you know, just just become flammable in, in minutes. And so I think there's like a younger contingent of these millennials that think, hey, look, my, you know, my American dream is different. I like to travel and I've got, you know, investment opportunities on my phone. Just put me in some new stuff that looks cool in between, you know, an apartment unit and a house that I've got to actually tend to. And the fact that some, in some cases I'm priced out because I don't have the down payment, but in many cases I'm of means and I just want to be in a nice place to live. And so I think that's why this thing has become so popular with not just millennials, but boomers and even nesters, you know? So, so that's, that's kind of why we, we decided, Hey, look, let's really try and see how far we can push this thing. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, with, with new construction like this, I mean, you're, you're keeping your repairs and maintenance to as minimum as you probably possibly can. Yeah. You know, we, uh, so the average, typically a lot of the bigger guys are managing for 29 to 31%. And, you know, for, for their expenses, the ratio of their income, as you know, with apartments, you're closer to 50. We're probably in that 35, maybe 34 to 35 range. But when you think about that, this is new stuff too, right? And so, you know, when you're a heavy value add multifamily investor, and let's just say you're an LP or a passive investor, there is still some kind of uncertainty about what's what are the bones of this property that may be from the 80s or 70s. You know, I don't know exactly what I'm up against. There could be some you know, plumbing, all that stuff. You do your due diligence, but there's still an X factor. And uh, with this, I, we just feel like there's a, a little less uh, uncertainty. You know, we know what we're we're building, and there's going to be certainly change orders and kinks as with any new project. You know, the hot water was on the wrong. You know, but but for the most part, you kind of know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And, and well, then on the income side, you know, you, you also know you're getting probably a stickier tenant. So you're not paying those turnovers every month like that usually sucks out a big portion of your expenses. Right. If you're an investor, if you've got tenants staying in there for you know a couple of years at a time and you've got kind of written in increases into your leases, then, you know, you got a pretty, pretty steady you know, uh, stream. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Again, if you want more information or maybe even get involved, uh, head over to legacyacquisitions.com. I'm going to make sure to have that link in the show notes. And then uh, if you uh, send me over some more of that information, including some videos, I'll also embed those in the show notes for people to easily click through. Um, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time here today. Uh, but before I let you go, is there a question you wished I would have asked you here today? Yeah, you know, I see I see these guitars in the back, like, you know, maybe just something about, uh, you know, personally, like, I told you I was a musician. Well, dude, would you want to like jam or, you know, <laughs> play or... You just want to talk I, I about think, built to rent. I think, I th yeah, you're, you're that that part of what I could do is, I mean, we could we just classify that as train wreck. But no, man, I think you covered it. I, I just, I love, I love your show. I love uh, listening to your show. So it's an honor really to be here. Um, if anybody you know is curious, I love. My, I got a team, you know, of eight, and we just love helping uh, new investors, partners, uh, people that are kind of curious about you know, hearing about my horror stories over 20 years of being in the game. So, um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, Legacy Acquisitions, you can find us and uh, we're here to help. And I, I know you are as well as you offered before your show for intros. So we want to try and uh, we want to try to uh, do the same thing. No, really appreciate it. That's a great mindset to have too. I mean, I think uh, early on in the series, uh, you know, we used to say, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's exactly the case. You know, most, most real estate investors, we're not here to compete. We're here to help each other. Yeah. I remember what my mentors did for me and they, they changed the trajectory of my life. And if I can give just a small piece of their wisdom, you know, I think that, 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 uh, that I'm morally obligated to, but plus I like it. I just love talking with people, figure, you know, some people get so, so stuck in, and, and what they're doing and they they overthink some of these things. And I, I like to kind of shake people because I know that I was one of those that, you know, it took took some time for me to eventually kind of figure out that, hey, look, I can I can do this thing. And uh, 
So if, if I can just be a cheerleader for some of these younger uh, partners, I'd love to do that as well. No, I really appreciate it. Again, it is LegacyAcquisitions.com. Really appreciate your time. Hope we can do again, do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you, Jack. So much. I appreciate it. Have you learned at least one actionable step to incorporate into your real estate investing? If so, please consider returning some of that value by leaving a positive review, subscribing to our YouTube channel, or joining our growing network on Facebook and Twitter. You can find links to all of our social media accounts in the show notes. See you next time.